today's topic or uh, what we're going to unpack or, or we're calling it decode, basically what's the, what's the language behind what happens uh, at, a, at a local level with community change. We're focusing on one community in specific and that's South Bend. Uh, we have two partners on this presentation, uh, Tim, Tim Corcoran, who's the planning director uh, for the city of South Bend and Neil Heller, who's the principal of, of Neighborhood Workshop. And Neighborhood Workshop is a separate firm uh, working with, uh, with the city, um, independent of our work, but you'll see the parallels in between. Um, interestingly, the three of us are all urban designers. So uh, for any designer on the audience, don't fear numbers. The three of us actually talk math um, and we'll talk about it today. So uh, uh, first, Tim. Uh, Tim's the planning director for South Bend. He has 14 years experience in the field of urban design and town planning. Uh, before his role with the city, he actually worked in, in Sydney, Australia for a company called Roberts Day, uh, a, 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 a top end uh, new urbanist firm in uh, Australia. And uh, he returned to South Bend, which is actually his hometown, uh, um, to work with the helping the future of the city. Our work actually started before Tim, but also through Tim uh, in the process. It actually started with Mayor Pete's term uh, before that. Um, next, we have uh, Neil Heller, who's an urban planner and designer who focuses on aligning municipal regulations with the kinds of development outcomes they want to see. So it's, it's great to paint a pretty picture, but how does it work and what's the financial terms behind that? So Neil will focus on uh, urban design, but also housing policies, real estate development, uh, and, and financial mechanisms. Uh, Neil brings a user-focused fo design uh, to, to, to his applications and consulting, as well as audit auditing, calibrating local housing policies, running a pro forma base. For those of you that don't know what a pro forma is, is basically it's a real estate spreadsheet that shows how real estate operates uh, to see projects through their compliance and adoption in order to, to strengthen local tax base and, and build local wealth. So it's good to have plans, it's good to have ideas, but how do you get it built? And that's where Neil's gonna come in. So really quickly through the, through the South Bend model, there's a few things at play in South Bend. This is a value per acre model. You can clearly see downtown, but there's actually downtown is not this piece. This is downtown here. And there's a big white splotch here in the North part of town. That's, that's a, a Notre Dame University. By Notre Dame, there's actually kind of a second downtown or a mini downtown called uh, Eddy Street Commons. And here it is here, uh, which is sort of a new urbanist infill development. Um, it's something that's kind of aggregated over time, but it's quite powerful. Um, and it, this shows a, a dual uh, core uh, city, if you will, uh, generally spread to the West where all the manufacturing was. And um, this is the way that it's valued. So this is the taxable value, but there's policies that are at play that actually harm uh, the city at a local level, these are actually created by the state. These are all the incentives that are given away. So you can see the difference between the two of them. So essentially by all tax breaks that are given at a local level to individual voters, the city actually loses about $2 billion uh, worth, of, worth of value. So when we talk about incentives, we talk about homeowner exemptions, all this other stuff, it actually does have an effect on the ground in how to run a city. And the state made some huge changes um, and then had to like, backpedal and try to figure a way out of it. But we had to visualize that for them. But just so you see, these are the models. Um, some of the key things about South Bend in particular is a Rust Belt town um, had the, the typical effects of Rust Belt uh, decline uh, in community. So on the bottom left there is the population growth in South Bend's apex year was 1963. That's when they lost population and they sort of flatlined. On the right is their pipes going in the ground and I'll drop a boundary when their population stops. So right about uh, like 1963 is right about, let's go here. So this is when their population stopped. You'll see one of the patterns that they did is they just kept growing. There's a lot, of, I grew up in a Rust Belt community. They keep on sprawling the same way as everything else, but can you handle that infrastructure? Can you carry it? It's even worse in a Rust Belt situation. So just some key indicators uh, in this is uh, Josh McCarty was doing the analysis and he just focused on force mains, which are, uh, the expensive pipes in pink, you can see in 1960, they had um, uh, about that much, two, two and a half blocks of, of forest main and three lift stations. What they've grown to now, now remember they have less population today than they had in 1960. This is the amount of forest mains and lift stations they have. So they're adding all of this infrastructure and not adding people. So that cost per person is gonna get really high. So just to cap, recap on this, in 1960, they had 132,000 people. They had uh, not even three tenths of a of a mile of, of, of force main. 
and uh, three lift stations. This is their population now, 103,000. This is their force mains and their lift stations. So a 22% decline in population since 1960, but a 6,000 and 1,000% increase in infrastructure. This stuff needs to be paid for. It needs to be maintained. It needs to be replaced. And this is the casualty of what happens with suburban growth is that it feels good um, almost immediately, but then you have these long-term effects. And that results in their model. So this is the side view of their model with their revenue coming out of the ground and their costs spread across the city. Um, and this is a cost, geospatial cost. It's not just uniform, like dividing it by people. We're looking at the miles of pipe and the people that are further out on those mileage should be paying more for it because they're consuming more of it. So this is the net of the revenue against the cost, um, top view of the model. And you can see the bleeding that happens all around it. Um, one of the things that we broke down is how do you give the ingredients to the urban design team and to also Neil to understand like, well, what are the key ingredients of your city? And urban designers, we talk this way about building typologies. And this is the simplest way of looking at it. We call this the Brady Bunch slide, but it's basically residential, low density, medium density, high density, mixed use, low, medium and high, commercial, low, medium and high density. And these are actual buildings in South Bend. Um, and these are their sticker prices. So right away, we can see that single family detached house on average is losing about $2,000 um, per acre. Uh, per that per that typology. So the more that you do of it, you should have, if you're going to do that, that's great. Just make sure you have more of the other stuff that's net positive to compensate for. It. And then also one final takeaway before I flip it over to Tim, is there's some analytic takeaways we found just really simple things like development patterns. So not all housing is created equal. This is this is 88 houses in an old traditional grid pattern. And then we took this 88 houses of, this is actually kind of a spectacular model. It's like a cul-de-sac of cul-de-sacs. It's, it's kind, of, kind of brilliant actually, but um, 88 houses here. So same number of houses, two different patterns. And just walking through the, the, um, the, the roads, the water pipes, sewer pipes, that's committed to that infrastructure and it's paying uh, an annual cost or is consuming an annual cost of 122,000. When you look at what it's paying in taxes to cover that infrastructure, it's about 21,000. So right there, you can see a deficit of 100,000. So remember all single family detached is operating at a deficit or a subsidy. So that's theirs. When you go and do the same for the other, and I'll, I'll come back to a wrap up to roll this all up, but you see $79,000 of cost and still a deficit, 22,000. So when you put them side by side, you can see that the, the neighborhood on the right is $122,000 of cost, $21,000 of revenue, $100,000 of net subsidy. And the neighborhood on the, on the, on the left here is only a $60,000 of subsidy. So same number of houses, 88 houses, and it's a, uh, you're, 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 you're subsidizing at about close to two times for that development pattern. So we did all of this to help Tim see the the cost of carrying this. This was a citywide analysis, but giving them key ingredients. Now I'm going to pass it off to Tim. I'm going to go on mute and I'll come back at the end and we'll have a conversation. And Tim's going to talk about what, what are the next steps and what do you do with this? And Tim can uh, unmute. I'm unmuted. There's the video. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Um, uh, Joe always paints a rosy picture for. Um, uh, decision makers within the city. Um, nothing scary about anything that he um, he and his team put together for uh, for the implications of of what it might take to make your community more um, financially viable. But uh, without the data, it, you can't make informed decisions. And what's been very interesting is um, one of the first things that I was asked to do when I started um, uh, this role in 2016 was to set up the presentation for Joe and his team to present the work that they had done. Um, and uh, that's when I met um, Joe and understood more about what Urban 3 does. And since then we've been able to update our, our models so we can see how we've grown and changed over uh, the last three to four years, uh, which has been, a, again, a good thing for, um, for us as decision makers and for the mayor uh, and council to see. Um, Joe asked us today to talk a little bit more about infill housing and, and how we've, uh, what we've done in the past to help facilitate infill housing. 
And one of the things that was sort of personally inspiring to me as a way to conceive of, of how to address the multitude of issues, which when I started, honestly, I did not even fully appreciate what all the issues were. Um, uh, my background is an urban designer. Uh, and when I worked in Sydney, Australia, uh, you could sell a shoebox for a half a million dollars and people would outbid each other to, to, to live in that. But we, we face in South Bend and probably many other Rust Belt cities, the opposite where um, it's hard to build a house in some of the legacy neighborhoods within uh, our community because of things like the appraisal gap um, and other reasons. And so I started to think about how we would try to tackle this issue or the issue of rebuilding our city because we, uh, from, a, from an infill perspective and, and trying to make sure that our decision makers understood that infill housing must be the number one priority uh, that the city needs to, to undertake that and retaining and um, making sure that the housing that we already have uh, will, will, will last and will stick around for as long as we can possibly have it. So I started thinking about this through sort of the lens of in incremental development and the Incremental Development Alliance uh, came and helped uh, do a, uh, a code stress test our, our, on our zoning ordinance. We knew that there were many um, many issues with our zoning ordinance that were preventing or slowing or hindering or just getting in the way of, of rebuilding in areas that had, um, you know, had, had, had housing in it before, but now had become essentially illegal because um, the zoning ordinance was uh, written by land use lawyers that had a very strong sort of suburban bias to it. Um, it looks like they copied Indianapolis's zoning ordinance at the time and um, we called it sort of zoning by Xerox. Um, I don't know, uh, a lot of other communities I think have sort of these codes that have come from someplace else and they do a find and replace with the names. Um, so what we started to do is really look at um, revamping our zoning ordinance to and tune it to South Bend specific uh, sites and what, how South Bend was developed um, it was, you know, developed pre-car, and we wanted to make sure that we kept a lot of the those urban values and bake that into our zoning ordinance re revamp. So we took this approach of looking at first making sure that the rules were in place that would help facilitate new development as well as perhaps get out of the way. Um, and that things that used to, to stop development. So things like minimum lot size, uh, any, we didn't have any minimum dwelling sizes, but making sure we didn't add things like that. Uh, we, we eliminated all parking uh, standards from the city. So there is no parking requirement. Uh, we helped to, um, we reduced setbacks, did contextual setbacks for urban neighborhoods and legacy neighborhoods that were the, the houses generally were closer together and on smaller lots. We introduced um, a new zoning classification to facilitate missing middle housing typologies. We legalized um, accessory dwelling units on every parcel within the city. And so we felt like we were doing the right things from a zoning ordinance perspective. We even took it to a quasi form-based code. Um, it's not quite that way yet, but um, it, it sort of is, is something that I think our development community and, and the and again, decision makers understand. So it's a, it's 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 going towards a little bit of that form-based code um, side of things. We reduced the number of uses from I don't know, so something like 500 uses down to like 65 uses. Um, we were trying to keep it as simple as possible. We wanted um, the average person to be able to pick up our zoning ordinance and understand, you know, how it how and what it would take to uh, get something built on their property. So all of these things were done in an incremental way. We started to update the zoning ordinance in 2017, 2018, uh, and did it a little bit like one piece at a time. Um, uh, and, uh, and so that if at the end, um, 
uh, there was some sort of political thing that was going to cause us to not be able to get the whole thing through. At least we've gotten some good regulations and some good rules changed. Um, but what it did is it helped us build a lot of trust with our uh, council and decision makers to the point where when we did come through with the complete revamp of the ordinance, uh, it passed 9-0 and uh, council people were saying it's the best thing that they've ever seen the city ever put out. So we're very proud of that. But that's really only one piece. And, and one of the things that I, I tell people who ask is that the zoning ordinance is the easiest thing that you can do in, in a community like ours to help facilitate development. It is literally, um, it is literally changing words on a, on a piece of paper. I mean, I know there's a lot of politics that go um, into that, but it's, it's, it's relatively cheap. Uh, it's easy. I think there are a lot of good ideas out there. You don't have to uh, dig too deep to find, out, find the, 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 the little things that any community can do to help facilitate and fill development. But what you really find is, is that especially in a Midwestern context and in a Rust Belt city uh, type of environment, there are a lot of other things that, we're, that we have to um, acknowledge and to sort of push back against. And one is that there's a very heavily, a heavy sort of suburban bias that's baked into not only what once was our, our zoning ordinance, but in the mindsets of people, even, even people who live in the city, um, you know, we've been living in a sort of a suburban mindset pattern in not just the Midwest, but in the United States and other places, and even Australia where I was working prior, um, that it takes a while to, to change that bias uh, and to refocus uh, why urbanism is important, which of course is one of the things that Urban 3 does a very good job of illustrating uh, graphically and through data to help people understand that. So I often would use that value per acre map as sort of the quickest way to explain to people that urbanism equals value uh, and that we needed to tune our codes to make sure that uh, those urban values um, permeated through all of the um, all of the all of the coding that we did and all the decision making that we did. So the next step that we've taken is to help, and this is primarily at the moment working with our community development corporations who are. Uh, trying to work in some of the challenging neighborhoods where, again, appraisal gaps are quite high, um, but they still, they, it, it, it's almost as if you, they, the art of building an urban house has been lost. And uh, all people know is a sort of suburban style and they think that that's the right thing to do. So we've since moved to, um, to looking at the design side and the urban design side of this problem by uh, uh, developing a suite of pre-approved housing plans. Um, this is um, something that uh, we hope will help not only with um, addressing the design side of the equation, but also help to help developers and CDCs who could uh, purchase these uh, pre-approved plans at a very um, you know, economic, cheap way, uh, that it reduces their soft costs to, to a, a project. And, um, and it's pre-approved. So you can buy the plan, you check the zoning, and off you go. You can go to a builder and um, build that product because it's uh, been already vetted by the city. So we're doing a, a suite of projects from an accessory dwelling unit up to a sixplex at the moment. And we're doing spec sheets on each one of these projects so that you'll know exactly how much it costs. We're doing sort of a high, medium, and low valuation on each of, each of, the, um, each of the plans. And what we hope is then this way we can utilize these, these pre-approved plans, not just for CDCs, but um, uh, by, by any developer or builder or anyone who wants to participate in helping uh, what I like to say is, is healing our neighborhoods um, through, um, you know, incremental development and incremental uh, changes. The final piece, however, um, is the hardest piece, and that is the financial side. 
to the equation. So we really do look at the um, entitlements, the zoning, we look at design, uh, pre-approved plans, and then finally, the uh, part that we're, we're trying to address now is on the financial side of the equation. And one of the things that, you know, is sort of this on the job learning that I didn't know when I, when I started this job, but has now become one of the most frustrating things uh, uh, about trying to um, rebuild and, and heal some of these legacy and older neighborhoods is the appraisal gaps that uh, we face in trying to get new construction. Um, we have very, very risk averse banks. Um, and as I talk to um, others in around the country, it seems that our banks are even more risk averse than others. So we, we have a situation in which banks don't want to lend money um, or have an aversion to, um, uh, to investing in some of these areas. They do have um, uh, these CRA credits that they're supposed to be using in, in, in places that are, have been damaged by things like redlining and, and, and uh, disinvestment over the years. But what we often find is that they're still looking for uh, pretty much a developer who's got a lot of capital resources behind them, uh, that they would have faith that that developer would be able to deliver on what they say they're going to deliver. But there aren't actually developers like that that are building in these neighborhoods. So a lot of those um, funds or that, that, that program is not being utilized the way um, I think it was intended to be. And so uh, the, we are, we're exploring right now ways to use uh, a loan loss reserve type of um, um, financial mechanism to help backstop potential loans uh, for mortgages in, in these areas. We are looking at um, helping to fund uh, sewer and water lateral connections, um, legacy cities and older cities, Rust Belt cities. Um, you know, we also have a lot of aging infrastructure. Um, some of it is close to 100 plus years old. <laughs> um, and, and there are a lot of, um, uh, there are a lot of challenges to that. Um, one of our developers that Neil has worked with um, went to build a, a tiny home on a, on a small lot and he went to look to see what it would take to get the sewer and water connect, connected and the, um, the uh, contractor quoted him $30,000 just to uh, dig a trench because the, the, the sewer line was 19 feet below uh, the surface of the street and it actually would take special excavation equipment to uh, connect the sewer line. So, you know, there are all these hidden challenges that we face uh, every day in order to, to facilitate infill development. So um, we've had some success uh, and our successes so far have been uh, with our CDCs and working with them using CDBG funding, home funding to help address the, the construction and the appraisal gap between uh, the cost of construction and, and what the uh, homeowner can get a mortgage for. And, um, we've been working with these folks for a while. Um, we're starting to see some success in, the, in those neighborhoods. And I think we're starting to see other neighborhoods see that success and wanting to piggyback off uh, what they've done. But it, the, the time that it takes to bring a CDC up to that, that skill level in which they are able to build a house and understand what it takes to um, just do basic level construction is it, it takes a while and so there's a lot of hand holding there there's a lot of trying to get people to work together to share information um, in order to uh, in order to facilitate this type of infill development across the city so there are some places in which it's happening uh, more uh, and one of those areas is an area that Neil uh, will talk about as well um, the area in the neighborhood that Neil's been working in is called the Near Northwest Neighborhood. It's uh, just to the northwest of downtown. Uh, the, it's adjacent to the St. Joe River. And um, it's an older neighborhood that's seen a lot of decline, but has also seen uh, a lot of renewed spirit as to trying to reverse that those trends and, and using their a CDC that's been in the neighborhood for 20 years as well as some small scale developers who have 
really decided to sort of take their neighborhood back, if you will, knowing that there is no, um, you know, no developer or whoever is going to come and save their neighborhood and that they need to, to do it themselves, have started down this path, um, acquiring property on tax sale and starting to uh, redevelop uh, or to uh, uh, fix housing houses that are already there, sort of one piece at a time. And maybe that's a good point or time to shift it over to Neil a little bit to talk about some of the things that he's been working on with um, some, some of our small scale developers. Yeah, thanks Tim. That was a great rundown um, from the zoning down to the nitty gritty because I think that oftentimes, um, you know, the big political conversations that are happening as folks around different locations around the country are changing their zoning or thinking about changing their zoning. Um, you know, I'm here in Portland, Oregon. We just got done with a five year plus single dwelling zone update. Yeah, uh, it was a big fight, um, big rift in the communities. <laughs> People uh, uh, jumping into different camps. Um, and uh, so, but we, we got through that. You know, um, now we're doing state level issues and I know places around the, the St. Paul's looking at updating their single family zones. Uh, but so it, it's interesting to think that that might be the be all end all of the great fights. You know, we're, we're, we're uh, grabbing that third rail of planning, you know, that in, in, in previous times only pirates would talk about, but now the pirates are being invited into the King's court to talk about uh, uh, dismantling single family zoning because of its exclusionary nature and its uh, benefits to housing solutions. But um, yeah, those things are highly political, but even after, like Tim said, even after those zoning gets changes, there's a whole jungle and there's a whole, uh, to, a whole obstacle course to get through to even see it happen, right? So the, and you know, the modeling I've done <clears throat> shows that most times whole neighborhoods are not gonna be demolished in fact, actually, if there are existing buildings, it makes it oftentimes even uh, more difficult to infill middle housing or, or infill housing in general, just because these building types, we're talking maybe up to four units or you know, maybe up to six, uh, really just can't absorb the acquisition cost. That's a, that's a big deal to buy a single family house in, in, and just to demolish it and throw it away. Um, so you know, some of the modeling I did with the new prototypes available here, here in Portland show that Really, it's going to be the backyard infill that'll be most likely feasible, you know, from a rental standpoint. Um, but let me share my screen here real quick, and uh, we we can look at some pictures because um, Tim was talking about the near northwest neighborhood, and so uh, Joe had mentioned, you know, performa based planning. Uh, it's kind of a term that I don't know is used very often. I use it because I feel like that's the kind of work that I do, you know. And so that is taking Joe's High level work and talking about patterns and how we're, we're, we're thinking about development in general um, and then grabbing an area of town and then uh, building it out so like uh, Tim said zoning's highly political right and so zoning changes could happen um, at that political level I feel like when I read a zoning code I'm reading the politics of the community and sometimes it might be a weird thing to do but I will open a city zoning code and read it and get a sense for, you know, who I think they might be a little bit um, by what's allowed in the use table and what's not allowed. You know, what is talked about, what is not talked about. Um, you know, it, you can oftentimes see sort of a, a certain bias. Um, so here was my opportunity to engage South Bend in this uh, Sherman Harrison uh, design, urban design charrette with Opticos. Um, and Opticos has this, as one of their, uh, Dan Perlick included that in his middle housing book as a case study. And so I like to talk about South Bend a lot. I think they're doing a great job. Um, but, you know, you can see all of these buildings here in red are infill. So we're working in an area of town that, uh, you know, that has high vacancy and hasn't seen development in, in upwards of 40 years. So how do we infill all these vacant lots? Um, and then so, and adjust the zoning code to make sure that these new building types can fit. And so part of that is, so when I'm talking about performer-based planning, it is a combination of building a real estate development performa that speaks to not just what planners care about, so it identifies the physical side of things, uh, how much you know, 
how much lot coverage is that going to take? How much area does the parking take up? You know, what are what are the necessary heights to make this fit or not? Um, and then see where that bumps up against the existing standards in the code. And then from there, you know, we can turn the dials. And as we turn the dials, we can see the effects that it has on the project financially. And then we can try to move these infill types toward feasibility. And we can also, so by doing that, even on a on, on a on a neighborhood-wide basis or block-wide basis, we can start to see where the uh, the, the quantify the effects of turning those dials. So that way it becomes a little bit less of a political conversation about whether we like a duplex or not. And more of like, well, if we turn this and our goal is, we turn this dial and our goal is affordability, maybe this reduces the rents by 5%, right? The necessary rents, assuming that developer returns stay the same. So um, we can, I can show you kind of a little bit of example here. You know, these are some of the unit types that we, uh, developed for South Bend, and then just adding, you know, these physical characteristics with these financial characteristics, uh, because these were intended to be used both for uh, zoning purposes and regulatory standards, but then also understanding the feasibility in the market. Who and who's even going to build this stuff, right? Uh, real estate development has become highly specialized, and I was happy to hear Tim talk about making his zoning code more approachable. Uh, you know, by the average person, because anybody that's going to be building infill is probably not going to be your highly sophisticated national developer. Um, you know, these are most likely going to be local folks, local CDCs, faith organizations. And if they need to get into the zoning code and understand some of these standards, uh, I think that's a, that's a great approach. Um, so, you know, we get into these, we talk about how much lot coverage that takes, you know, what does the building footprint look like? How much open space is that? And if we start to add units, what you know? What happens there, and, and, and are we okay with that? Um, and then get on to looking at, you know, even what is the start comparing the taxable value per acre of these units. So now we've made the full circle back to Joe's work, you know, and now at the at the micro level, we're seeing its relative value back to the city. Um, and then so, you know, like uh, Tim had mentioned, there are <clears throat> infrastructure upgrades that need to happen, and so then we can start to balance out on a you know, block-wide or district-wide, neighborhood-wide basis that the, what is being infilled will now help to start pay for any potential upgrades. And so they're not repeating the patterns of the past where you saw the multiple pipes, right? Now we can, um, uh, based on the future taxable value of what we're seeing here as a potential build-out and build that out over time, what can we actually afford to upgrade in the near term? So with that, um, I might ask Joe and Tim to come back on and we can chat more. So the three of us were chatting about this before in prep for this call. And one of the things that just kept on coming up with the three different ways that we're talking about, that we all are talking about the same thing, which is how do you make the stuff that's more potent for you easier to do? Um, and I, Neil, I think it was you that said, uh, legalize it. Um, just a great reference to um, some reggae, but uh, you know, it's 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 really it's it, it, it. I guess that's what we're all talking about here, which is we know it's better for you. In the case of South Bend, when you have a pipe and a road and all of that's there, and you have a building and then you have a vacant lot, that vacant lot has all the same infrastructure costs. And correct me if I'm wrong, but Tim, I think it was like two point five million dollars a year. Uh, South Bend is losing just in vacant lots, so. Um, I guess to, to kind of kick this off, how, how have you seen your work, um, Neil and, and Tim, how have you seen the community's application of, of Neil's work move the needle toward solving that loss? Sure. Well, um, so I think one of the biggest things is that the combined work has help to develop an acceptance within neighborhoods and within the political structure that we need to do this, all right? And I think that's a big hurdle, right? But there's an acceptance, I, I hope, that when you're in a, in a place, in a slow growth town, that you have to understand the things that you gotta do in order to make that market start to, to work and function again, right? So that general acceptance has been important. Uh, our work with 
uh, the CDCs have started to provide, um, uh, you know, ha has started to provide new homes uh, that are uh, happening in some of these places. And, um, and I think once you start to see that happen, um, you can more and more people want to sort of get on get on board with that. So it, it does have a, a small flywheel effect is, is, is happening, we hope, uh, because you can see the change that is happening uh, in, the, in those streets and in those blocks, you know, a very little bit, but a little bit at a time. Like Tim said, so there was a part of that, um, there was a part of that, that, that urban design master plan um, you know, that, that was that in the northeast corner of that, a small developer is working in, um, let me know if you can see this as the slide changes. Yeah, right? we, so we can see it, yeah. In, in terms of incremental and small scale development, there's sort of a, an ethos of, of building up your, what we call your farm, right? So this small developer lives in this neighborhood and he's committed to this neighborhood. And so he's looking at an area of town that he's committed to and wants to infill and build and so in a sense he's doing a, a uh, scattered site project right, on all these empty lots including the takedown of a of an old bakery building which is a um an interesting so he's got small scale and, and a large scale renovation happening um but the key part about this was that in order to get and tim you mentioned the flywheel and part of that was this phase one work that he was doing, which is buying just existing buildings that were there, renovating them. So really super small scale interventions and then getting an artist into the space um, at, at, at a lower rate, right? So it's more return on community than it is return on investment in the beginning. Um, and then there, and just to spin that flywheel the first time and, and get it going. So now by doing this though, now he's got these comps. Um, that then he can point to when he wants to go build something new and say, hey, there's something down the road that, that looks like this. This is how much it costs. This is how much the rents are. Um, and then now he can get an appraiser to say, oh, yeah, okay, you have something down the road. And then just sort of spin that flywheel again. You know. Um, so I think that, that, would, that understanding that initial first step, these super small scale interventions is probably super key you know, in, in an area like this that hasn't seen reinvestment in, in 40 years. So Neil, what you're what you're proving is you're essentially like the uh, the scientist producing evidence that yes, gravity does exist. It can actually happen. It does actually work, um, and that helps that helps Tim make the case for the, I guess the benefit to the community as well. And Tim, you'd mentioned something about making it easier and understanding I guess the uh, the, the baked in suburban biases and incentives. Um, one of the things that, that, that we've seen in the past, and I'm sure that you're experiencing this, is that you know, we see communities where it's, it's pretty easy to go out and build a strip mall at the edge of town. I've got a zoning process for it, but you know, God forbid the person that tries to do something downtown all of a sudden has to go through a design review process. They have to go through all these extra steps. Is, is there a conversation like that happening? You talked about these pre-approved plans, but is that starting to raise the, the consciousness to the fact that we've sort of greased the skids on bad development to happen. It also underpays in our community. Yeah, the, I, I think there, there's still from time to time a uh, problem or conflict, if you will, uh, that happens. But where it happens is when, um, when you have a developer or a builder who is uh, still in that suburban mindset, wants to take advantage of all the great things that have been happening downtown and in some of the neighborhoods adjacent to downtown, and and but and then and then implement something that is of a suburban nature, right? And that's when the zoning problems start to clash. All right, if you're trying to do something urban in an urban area, it's easy. It's as easy as you could possibly imagine. Um, it flies through the system. All right. We, we can have design review done in two weeks. And, um, and uh, you know, we are not the people to get in the way of good projects. But when you're trying to do something that is fundamentally against the, the values um, that are uh, so clearly illustrated in um, like the value per acre model, 
in the areas that we that we do uh, want to drive urban urbanism and urban buildings, that's when the politics and the, the zoning issues start to pop up. So um, that's those are where the problems happen. Um, you know, it's very easy to do urban projects in urban places with us. All right. It's when you start to try to do a suburban model in an urban place, that's when it becomes hard. Well, to that point, one of the things that, in addition to your department, one of the things that happened with the lift station analysis was that, uh, wasn't it your, your city engineer, she now asks for, what is it, two bonding cycles per lift station? So she realizes the cost and understands that, but now she's got the, I guess, the, the evidence uh, to, to produce that. Um, you know, and it's not just that, Joe, it's the fact that, you know, we've, we, we didn't even have a policy until last year about whether or not city services would be extended beyond the city boundary. And it was sort of done for a very long time at an ad, ad hoc basis. I think it was like who you knew. I don't know. I'm not even sure. What <laughs> doing, right? But, uh, but now, um, after some really contentious, um, uh, developers outside the city have been, you know, really trying to to get that. We put a policy in place. We use um, a lot of the data um, that we've, you know, gotten from you and other places, uh, and and now we just, you know, we won't do it anymore. And uh, there's some upset people, <laughs> for sure. But uh, um, it's made our life a lot easier. Well, actually, uh, as a bridge to Neil, and maybe a, a reference to. Uh, um, uh, this came in from the chat um, from Jacinda, which is uh, there's clear value back to the city to have this density. Uh, but what about the residents and constituents when they want those other that for them, their values might be different. And before I, I, I kick this off to Tim and Neil, uh, you know, Jacinda, the way that we see it at Urban 3 is we call it choice architecture, that we want to be able to explain that these choices are baked into the system. And one of the one of the jokes that I usually have is, you know, I want to be six foot tall and have a full head of hair. That would make me happy, you know, but there's a reality to a cost to making me six foot tall and having a full head of hair. Um, so if we do the same with the city and say, these are all choices that are in there. And if you want to choose to have low density, awesome. You just need to be aware of the cost and totality to your community if everybody made that choice. And that's the, the, the kind of the, the death by a thousand cuts that happen with most cities. In the case of South Bend, they've gotten into an arrest, if you will, where there's, they're, they've, they've peaked out in their population. And for those that live in Sunbelt areas or fast growing places, you're not going to be growing fast forever. Cities will reach their limit. And I think there is a lesson in South Bend that's applicable as much to Rust Belt places, but also to Sunbelt places. Uh, but, but with that, um, kicking it back to, to uh, Tim and Neil, could you both answer, like, how, how do you decipher through the, the value statement of what's a good value for somebody in, in, in within the context of the community. Yeah, you know, in, in describing or as, as, as we worked through our, like our ordinance update, I talked about values a lot. And I use the word both in terms of creating value and the values that drive that. And um, we aren't stopping uh, in, in a way suburban development in the county. Um, you know, you can go and do that if that's a place you want to live. But we've really tried to, again, tune the ordinance to allow for those urban values to come back in places that were urban, right? And it's easy to do that now. Um, and uh, we do show that, that, that you have to think about both of the, the value and the values together, right? Um, because it is all part of how you think about the place in which you live, but it has very real consequences as to how <laughs> getting the roads repaved or whether a police officer shows up at your front door when there's a problem or the fire department comes. Um, we can show that um, that if we don't do these things, um, you know, at some point we're not going to be able to to address those fundamental issues that the city is is here to provide. Like, what are the cities are here to do? Very core things, right? Infrastructure, you know, police and fire, um, you know, creating great places. Um, 
And if we can't do that because we don't have the value, then our values are wrong. <laughs> you know, so um, it is it is trying to put those things together. And I feel as though that conversation it hits home when you see places that, that have seen so much disinvestment and what it's going to take in order to change those. You know, flip that switch. And Neil, you've experienced this both in South Bend, but also in your hometown of Portland, where it's the other end of the spectrum, where you have a desirable, fast growing, um, high density place, but you're still looking for these solving other problems like affordability in housing. But how, would, how do you handle the, the values question? Yeah, um, Tim, I thought that was great. The value and, and the values, I think that's really, really good to um, you know, think about those in tandem. Um, but what I'm often tasked with looking at is, uh, you know, looking at the values in in like a, 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 a municipality's comp plan, and then going over to visit the, the zoning code and then see, you know, do are those values lining up? And I think that you know, in our latest comp plan update here in Portland, you know, there's in in most comp plans there's uh, values of uh, people able to afford a place. There's you know neighborhood amenity, um, but oftentimes those, um, those, uh, I, I think some of our unified development ordinance or our, our zoning code, you know, start to uh, hinder that. And so by calibrating, you know, in my work, calibrating that to see those values actually be realized um, is, is probably what I experienced the most. And, um, actually, I'm going to bring a question here from uh, some random person named Jim Kuman. Perhaps you've all have heard of him. Hi, Jim. Um, come across that name a couple of times. <laughs> but uh, Jim asked a question about the, the zoning upgrade in Sherman Harrison area and how to calibrate uh, what zones and in, in the corridor and to the interior. Like, how do you, I guess, going from the, the corridor area of commercial into the neighborhood? Like, how, how did you handle that, that kind of that um, filtering, if you will, from commercial into, into residential transition zones? Sure, and I think it's also about the, the 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 map that Neil showed earlier on the infill development there. What we did is um, through so one of the one of the great things, and I mean we we tackled a lot of things in in 2018 and 2019 where we were um, not just updating the zoning ordinance, but we were doing a neighborhood plan at the at the time. A neighborhood plan was the near northwest neighborhood. We picked it on purpose, um, and the thought was to use it as a kind of a bit of an experiment. I mean, I don't, we don't tend to like experiment on people, but use it as a way to test the things that we were doing behind the scenes. So we're not only testing how buildings sit on lots, but we're testing the financial models that go behind it. And so as we're doing all those testing together, the reality then is, is like, okay, well, what is the new, zone that this all fits in and how do we calibrate um, from uh, Lincoln Way West, which is a commercial corridor that is one of the bounding um, era streets of this neighborhood, which has a lot of um, uh, commercial elements, some that hasn't seen a lot of success in a while, but then moving, calibrating the density back from there into the neighborhood. And it was through the neighborhood planning process that we gained the um, the neighborhood buy-in to mass rezone the entire neighborhood. So when we did the zoning ordinance update, what we then did is at the same time, we went back to about 2014, I would say, where we had neighborhood plans that we still thought were valid and, and had and were done in a, in a way that we still believed like we're bringing forward like the right ideas. And we mass rezoned all those neighborhoods at the same time as bringing through the, um, the, the zoning ordinance update, which is when we're legally able to do some of those types of things. And so in that way, we have now, uh, you know, all the, um, uh, you know, all these, all these types of develop, this type of development that the master plan uh, was hoping to deliver is now legalized throughout all of those places. And we, we continue to do that through a neighborhood planning process. It's slow, but it, it does have the advantage of having the neighbor buy into it. So um, that's how we've been able to calibrate um, uh, using those 
those zoning types and, and um, through, through that neighborhood, for instance. I hope that answers the question because I know he knows the answer, but. Uh, yeah, Tim, uh, one of the questions in the chat was uh, actually a comment from uh, Dan Clock, I think it's Clocky, um, that have you, have you uh, ever tried to talk to the Notre Dame Federal Credit Union about yeah. backing? What's been the response there? So we can call them right now if you want. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the greatest thing about, I, I, I really enjoy speaking with uh, some of the leadership at Notre Dame Federal Credit Union and they are conceptually very much on board with all of this, all right? But what has happened is while the president might think all this is great because he grew up in this neighborhood, when he goes back to the mortgage board or the lending board, he, he comes back with the no, like spreadsheet says no. All right. And so all the things that they that they believe in, certainly the leadership believes in, um, has not really come to fruition through the actual process <laughs> of getting a loan. And um, the Ward Bakery building that Neil sort of alluded to a second ago um, is, is, is a great example where the, the bank just won't lend enough money to help the developer get through what they need to do to get the building up and running so that they can lease it. Um, they will not take any risk. And it's not just Notre Dame Federal Credit Union. I don't want to like throw them under the bus. It's like, ev it's every one of them. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, actually there. There's a uh, one of uh, our parent company. Uh, Pat yeah, I very Whelan. much like that. I just want to make that yeah. a note, Dan. Dan, said, they're great people. <laughs> you know, bank. Bank. In one of his comments, where banks are happy to give money to people who don't need it. Uh, you know, at Urban Three, we're experiencing that right now with trying to purchase a small office building to to grow into, and we're still having problems. So it's the the, the financial industry is is kind of a little messed up. Um, and Tim, you had mentioned looking at, and, and this is maybe a lesson for every city that's on, anybody that's any city that's on this uh, webinar. Um, what about ARP money? Can we use that as a, as, a, as a backing mechanism? There's lots of ways that cities could help with the gap or to buttress uh, the gaps in this. And, and I, I just wanna close with maybe a last question on this. Um, my experience with South Bend, I'm sure that this has been Neil's experience with South Bend. Tim, you're a native, um, your community is different. You know, every community has got its own unique culture to it. And one of the things that's been a pleasure to work with South Bend is to experience the honesty that people will have the conversation. Um, it's almost brutal honesty that we can put this information out there and there will be people that wanna hang on to their biases. There will be people that will be somewhat selfish, but as a community, you are all talking about how you're in it together. Um, and I think that actually has been helpful in, in what you see or in the audience, what you can see is this kind of honesty to look at, it, at the data and put it front forward to start the conversation. I don't know if there's something different in your water. I don't know if it's due to um, the economic collapse of South Bend or <laughs> Notre Dame University, but what, what is it with a special sauce in your ability not, to do that? I'm not exactly sure, Joe, but what I can say is that um, I feel like every, like you're right, every community is different and there are a lot of challenges here. They're not necessarily different than a lot of challenges that other communities face. But what I found was, is that we were ready for a, a zoning change. Every council member, they didn't even know what it meant, but they know they wanted it. Because why? They were getting the stupidest things come to them and like all these stupid fights about whether or not you could build on something again. And I mean, I was having crazy conversations because we didn't even have a plan commission at the time. So in the same time, I created a plan commission for South Bend um, that because it was part of the county at the time where the county was denying things in the city of South Bend and it was blowing people's minds, right? So like the, 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 the time was ripe for change, all right? And, and, I, and I, you, you have to sort of test the political winds and see which way it's blowing. And basically the reason why it passed so easily was in a way, everybody wanted something changed. They didn't exactly know how or what. Um, we did it incrementally, we built, the tr we built the trust. And so when it came time to like, kind of do the big reveal and show this, this brand new ordinance, it was celebrated. It wasn't, it wasn't you know, uh, attacked. There was, there was, it was the easiest meeting you've ever had in your entire life, all right? Um, 
and and um, I invited all the the consultants that had helped us put it together, and and it was almost like a letdown <laughs> that there was that there wasn't a little bit of like contentiousness to it, you know. Um, so I don't know if that's part of the special sauce. You just got to know like when somebody's ready for something, all right? Um, and we were ready for change. We had seen so much decline, and um, from that that peak level that um, we knew we needed to do something. Our neighborhoods were disintegrating. Houses were being torn down. You know, they were, everything was going away. What do you do? If you're a council person, you know, you have to try to reverse these trends and nothing had worked in the past. <laughs> maybe we should look, you know, maybe we should change our, our tack. And, you know, uh, this, the census came out recently and South Bend grew by 2.26%, which is the fastest growth rate uh, in the city's history since 1950. And it's the first time in a hundred years that the city grew faster than St. Joe County. Wow. In fact, if you were to take out the growth of South Bend and our other towns in the, in the county, I have a feeling the county lost population. And our, our, our premier suburb, uh, Granger, Indiana, actually lost people through household size uh, decline. So, you know, I feel like we're doing the right things. We're focusing on the right things and we're seeing the results. Well, that's great to hear. And uh, Neil, closing comments? Yeah, I think the wisdom from South Bend that I've had the direct experience with is them not chasing after, you know, catalytic projects that would require a huge subsidy. You know, the small scale developer whose farm I modeled is scattered site infill, you know, resulted in 50 residential units, uh, many of them with privately provided affordable housing rental rates. Um, and a whole range of middle housing types that were that many communities are trying to, to see implemented from tiny houses to four plexes, six plexes, uh, a multi-generational triplex, you know, this whole this whole smorgasbord of housing types for, for you know, for the neighborhood characters. Um, but when modeled against the 50 unit mixed use building as a catalyst building that would require massive subsidy just to get it to market rate rents. And, you know, maybe, and I think that uh, that's often the case, right? Uh, they're chasing after, folks might chase after the silver bullet, but I think the wisdom in South Bend was to actually go to the other side and say, yeah, let's try to get these tiny houses legalized. <laughs> well, so yeah, that, yeah, yeah, just this, just, uh, just like my last comment there is just that no one's coming to save your town. <laughs> You know, no one is going to come and save your neighborhood. Um, it takes uh, the neighborhood to come back and, 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 and the people who live there really sort of take it back, own it and rebuild it and heal it and, uh, and like let them do it, you know. So well, thank you both for your comments and taking your time out of your day to be part of this. I want to thank everybody else that has been on the webinar watching. Uh, our next our next uh, webcast is going to be the 30th of, of uh, September. Um, please sign up, continue to sign up. I know a lot of we have a lot of repeat repeat viewers here. Uh, send us your questions. If you need us for a project or a lecture, please reach out to Kate or Caitlin um, on that. And thank you for attending today and we'll see you next month. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Uh, great. Thank cha you. Great chatting with you. Thanks, Take care. All.